this is all the setup that we used to make the experiments. And as, guess, as you can see, it's really complicated. Uh, there are so many wires going everywhere. And the reason it has to look like that is just because the experiments we do are different from what we're used to. For example, we need to make the atoms be as cold as we possibly can. This lab studies ultra-cold atomic physics in which uh, atoms are cooled to temperatures of you know, billionths of a degree above absolute zero. Much, much colder than any kind of matter that's naturally occurring in the universe. And at those temperatures, uh, atoms stop behaving like particles and start behaving like quantum objects, more like waves. And we also have a lot of control over them when they're that cold. So we can uh, put them into interesting arrangements uh, that we can sort of program using lasers and then study uh, the, qu the, the quantum effects of putting many of these op uh, interesting quantum objects together. One of the uh, beautiful things about the experiments is that most of the light that we use is actually visible. So for example, the main transition for lithium is red and that is why you can see all that red glow because we need to prepare the light that is special for the atom that we are trying to study. So for, we know uh, what kind of atomic structure lithium has and we know that it interacts very well with that kind of light and that's why we have to make it at that color. And it's very visually impressive, like just how everything looks. We've uh, made measurements on an effect called the spin charge separation, which is a, an effect that is uh, remarkable and uh, confounding all at the same time. Uh, it involves uh, electrons that are confined to one-dimensional wires. So wires that are so thin, there's only one channel for the electrons to flow. And in that situation, it's very special uh, because the electrons, if one electron bumps into one next to it, that electron bumps into the one next to it, and so on, and that propagates on down the chain. That's very different than the three-dimensional world where uh, an electron can go around another electron. You can't do that in one dimension. So the work that we've done most recently involves one-dimensional fermions. A fermion is like an electron, but in our case, it's an atomic fermion. It's an atom, lithium atom, that uh, is um, mimics the uh, behavior of electrons. Was that we put a, a gas of atoms in, in these 1D tubes, and we were able to excite what's analogous to the charge and spin modes of an electron independently. And we were able to measure their velocities. And we were able to see that the charge mode, which is uh, how the charge propagates down these 1D wires, it actually travels faster than the spin mode. And this was something that was predicted many decades ago. But we were able to uh, tune those speeds and, and move between a regime where those speeds are equal and there is no spin charge separation to a regime where they are different and separated. That's quite bizarre because uh, you, if you think about it, it's like the spin and charge of an electron splitting in space because they have different speeds and we were able to observe that. The number one thing to think about is that as uh, the semiconductor industry moves towards smaller and smaller features, uh, eventually we'll get to the atomic scale where one dimensional uh, when we enter the 1D regime. And these, the 1D physics becomes important. And we may get to a stage where uh, we need to take, uh, to uh, be careful about moving charge and spin along these 1D wires because they move differently. The other aspect is that there are some interesting quantum mechanical features of these 1D wires that could be potentially used for quantum computing in the future. So uh, people are very interested in two dimensions and one dimension because interesting, uh, you can encode quantum information in unusual ways in these reduced dimension systems and which may make them more robust for, for quantum computing.